Hang tight before we talk about the legendary conflict between DC's greatest heroes and the Injustice Universe's military regime. I want to give special thanks to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring this video. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game. Choose a real country to lead into battle during World War III and fight up to 128 other players in real-time games that can take weeks to complete. You can use many different units to build your army, tanks, jets, nuclear submarines, etc., and declare war on your neighbors or forge alliances with other players. Plus, you can play the same account on both PC and mobile. You can get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Offer only available for 30 days. Don't wait and get in on the action now. As a game, I like Injustice. It's a solid fighting game with great rosters, fun mechanics, unique moves, and cool stages. It's a great video game. I have a lot of fun playing it. But I've always taken issue with the part of Injustice people generally seem to focus on the most the major impact it's had on the character of Superman and the DC Universe along with it. The story about Superman becoming an evil mastermind tyrant and Batman having to stop him with a ragtag crew of rebels has permeated the fandom's mind so deep for that last 10 years that it seemed inescapable as part of discussions of any of these characters. Injustice was conceived as a fighting game with the intent to answer who would win in a fight between Batman and Superman. And bizarrely, the answer is that Batman would win by getting another Superman to fight Superman for him. Kind of seems a little cheap. But the evil alternate universe version of Superman, we'll call him Todd, has become so transcendently popular as a concept and Superman discourse has really shifted because of Todd's presence. I totally understand liking Injustice as a game. I do too, because it's fun as hell. But I hate how people latched onto it as if it was some fresh new idea that we have to lay massive importance on. This game and its sequel ruined the entire conversation surrounding Clark Kent and Superman as a character for the past decade. Oh, but Superman's only interesting when he's evil! Go check out The Boys, or Squadron Supreme, The Sentry, Invincible, A God Somewhere, Red Sun, Irredeemable, Crime Syndicate, Miracle Man, Superboy Prime, Super God, The Mighty, Overman, fucking Brightburn. There's no shortage of evil supermen after and before Injustice. It didn't come up with this idea, so it's just another one to throw on the pile. It's nothing new or groundbreaking. In fact, even the DCAU did an alternate universe bad guy Superman twice. Brave New Metropolis was a world where Superman couldn't save Lois Lane's life, so he started working for Lex Luthor and became an evil fascist dictator that eliminated all crime in the city. In the Justice Lords universe, Lex Luthor killed the heart and soul of the Justice League, the Flash, and Superman and the rest of the gang all agreed to kill his punk ass and become fascist dictators that eliminated all crime in the world. Injustice is like a fusion of the two, where Superman is tricked into killing Lois and causing the destruction of Metropolis by the Joker. Killing the Joker drove Superman mad with grief, and then, like, Somehow the majority of the Justice League was down to clown with the murder of freedom worldwide just because he said it was a good idea. Except Green Arrow and Batman. The former had his head punched off. As far as Elseworlds stories go, I can buy that a different path in life can lead a character to making wildly different choices. Red Sun Superman was a dick because he was raised by different people in a different part of the world in a different time period under completely different social circumstances. With those experiences being so heavily changed, he's essentially a completely different person. Your experiences are what make you who you are. That's kind of the whole idea of Elseworlds. But it's a massive stretch for me to believe the Superman that was raised on the farm in Kansas with Ma and Pa Kent with the wise teachings of Jor-El would still ultimately be capable of all this. And yet after this came out, it seemed like everyone online was convinced that if Lois Lane died in any world, this set of events was a certainty. The only really staggeringly different thing about this universe is that Lex Luthor is Superman's friend and was never a villain to begin with. I guess you can make the argument that without an arch nemesis to challenge him, keep him grounded and humble, Todd never had any vision of what kind of damage he could do with good intentions. It's thin, but it's an important distinction to make between Todd and Superman, and people often ignore or forget this big part of the story with Lex. 
then Injustice's popularity started bleeding into the movies and further spreading the idea that a dead Lois Lane begets Super Madman. But like, we've also had a story from the 90s where Lois dies because of the Joker and that's not what happened at all. Superman had him turned in and someone else killed him. But Kingdom Come isn't as popular as Injustice despite being way better so no one talks about that. The way this story is so well regarded and treated like a logical endpoint is maddening. And yet, as popular as Injustice was, the animated adaptation seemed to have garnered massive backlash when it came out. Everyone insisted that this was a butchered and terrible adaptation of the games and comics and ruined the story. So for me, someone who doesn't like the story in the game and the comic, having that butchered actually made me like it more than the source material. I'm not usually a big contrarian hot take guy, but I really feel like this movie got judged unfairly by people before they even watched it because of a handful of clips online and just maybe a general dislike of recent DC animated movies. The animated movie condenses the monolithic story of the Injustice universe from dozens of comics and multiple games into a really digestible 80 minutes. And what major changes it makes to the story? I actually think it makes it a lot less irritating for me personally, given that so many things from the source material annoy the shit out of me. Hiding from the cops. Aren't there any good guys here? <laughs> Green Arrow wouldn't say that. Injustice as a premise only works if you have about 80 to 90% of the characters acting out of character and just being cowardly, insane and twisted, or just downright stupid. Given that we've known these characters for decades and had so much material to get to understand them with, I just can't get behind some of these decisions with them being treated as something they'd naturally do if pushed far enough, or a more realistic version of their personalities. I can't happily live with the idea that all of our heroes are just a few bad days away from being fascist dictators and murderous villains. I'm not Garth Ennis, I'm sorry. Given that Injustice just doesn't work for any of these characters, period, the movie still struggles with this, a lot, especially with Superman's downfall. But at the very least, I think the movie version spares a lot of the characters from the same god-awful mischaracterization that makes the story so viscerally wrong in my eyes. You know, mostly. Don't you just hate when they butcher your favorite characters? Oh god, I meant figuratively. Okay, I knew people threw a major fit when a clip of this scene was released online, but between this and the trajectory Flash takes in the games, I actually much prefer him getting killed in a nonsense way than becoming a henchman for a ruthless overlord. I mean, sure, it's not clear how this could kill him with all of his talk about Atto seconds. They really shot themselves in the foot with that dialogue because it just begs the question of how he could be hit by anything ever. A character in near perpetual bullet time that can move faster than light and time travel is a problem to keep around sometimes. I always wondered why Todd didn't just send him back in time to save Lois and the baby, seeing as how he probably doesn't care about the ethics of time travel. He'd already said he'd steal them from the mainline universe anyway, given the chance. After I've killed you, I'll bring Lois here. When she sees how I've perfected this world, she'll, she'll be afraid and disgusted. She'll be alive! Even Batman floats the idea of time travel just because he wants everything to go back to normal, but Flash chooses not to because he thinks the world deserves to be a shitty place? Or something? It's hand-waved off very quickly. You don't need the Flash around for this. His redemption arc in the games always annoyed me because I just never thought he'd be down for the regime in the first place. It shouldn't have taken seeing Abusive Man lasering a child's face off for him to start asking questions. God, that's so fucked up. He picked that kid up from school, and he still lasered his brains out. In the Injustice comics, he watches Todd and Wonder Woman brutally cripple a young superhero for trying to defend Australia's right to protest Superman's actions. He stands there and lets it happen, and then finds out that this kid used to look up to him and even met him once. And he still joins the regime and plays ball with Todd. Then an actual villain like Sinestro tells Todd he's doing a great job, and the Flash just goes, Hey man, we can't trust him, and then keeps going after everyone ignores him. Barry's just this cowardly pussy that objects a little bit and then folds instantly. This sucks, I'm glad the movie skipped over the Flash entirely because that's unworkable. 
Better to die like a punk than have his character assassinated to hell and back and make him look like a chump. His dumb, false equivalence, pro-gun, slippery slope speech during the chess game is given to Mr. Terrific instead. Shame about that. Some characters in the Injustice world are spineless, jellyfish cowards. Others, like Wonder Woman, are evil psychopaths with no remorse. Injustice Wonder Woman lacks all compassion and is constantly pushing Todd towards more escalation and cruelty for the greater good. And I think half the horrible shit that happens in this story is a result of her being the devil on his shoulder. Like, there's no descent into the evil for her. Todd at least has a motivation to go crazy. She's just like, like that from the start before anything tragic even happened. She has no impetus for turning evil the same way as Super Sad Sack. These comics depict her as just eagerly waiting for an opportunity to corrupt Todd just so she could be his murder queen. That's not Wonder Woman. She's compassionate and gentle and caring and doesn't manipulate people or obsess over getting a man to like her. This and Flashpoint seem to trick people into thinking she's constantly decapitating people or trying to sleep with powerful men. I thought, actually, if I was going to give credit where it's due, the game did a decent job of illustrating the difference between this violent she-devil monster woman and the real Wonder Woman, but people seem to just ignore that because it doesn't support their argument that she's always a murderous, bloodthirsty maniac given the opportunity. The movie has her side with Superman very enthusiastically at first, just like the book, then as time goes on, she starts questioning him. In the book, she has reservations about teaming up with Sinestro and using a yellow lantern ring, but ultimately backs down and lets Todd do his thing all the time. There's no line that he can cross that will completely shake her. Her role as the evil presence whispering in Todd's ear to escalate his violence was given to Ra's al Ghul instead. Ra's al Ghul is already, like, always about using fear and murder to get his idea of justice. He played no part in the Injustice Years 1 through 5 comics, but a powerful guy like him would totally see Todd's super fascism and want to get in on that. He can be the evil side ho. Plus, the attempt at a romance thing is waved off really fast with Todd reasonably going, nah, this is weird. It also helps that the events of this movie are much less dragged out than the five years of the comics, instead taking place over what I think might be just a couple months at the most. She sees him commit an atrocity in killing all the teenagers in the Joker rave and is disturbed instead of going, Yeah man, they deserve that, you're so big and strong and morally righteous. In the comics, Superman does this, and the only person who calls him out on it is Cyborg, and even he quickly just gets over it, and the whole event never actually amounts to anything because the footage of it is deleted before Batman can post it. Wonder Woman never even knows about this in the book. At least the movie does something with it instead of dropping it entirely so weird. The big thing near the end of the movie for Wonder Woman is that she goes out of her way to save Plastic Man, who is an opposing hero on Batman's team, instead of like, trying to cut his head off. And after everyone puts aside their differences to defeat Amazo, Todd is like, alright, back to the feud, and she goes, but they just saved us, and decides to turn on Todd completely. Finally, she like, snapped back to her senses. Todd being caught in 4K killing a literal insane clown posse is just one of multiple major plot points introduced in the comic that is never followed up on or doesn't really have any satisfying payoff after it's set up. A lot of things just randomly happen and then are like quickly forgotten. Like Nightwing's entire inclusion. Robin, Damian Wayne, throws a baton at Nightwing because he's an arrogant little brat and it accidentally kills him. I did always like the simple brutality of this because sometimes life is just like that. You could win a thousand hand-to-hand -hand martial arts battles, but sometimes you just fall down and hit your head and that's it! The Injustice animated movie utilizes Nightwing's spirit becoming Deadwing to a greater effect. Whereas in the comic he appears to mildly help out during Year 3's magical buffoonery, he could have easily been cut out and doesn't contribute in any meaningful way to the plot or the other characters. I truly think his entire involvement was so he could just give his old costume to Damien and make him wearing it in the game feel slightly less horrifically disrespectful. But the movie version of Deadwing has him take a direct role in rehabilitating Damien Wayne and getting him to switch sides so he doesn't just completely give up on his father Batman. He also helps save the day at the end by stopping Ra's al Ghul with his little brother. I like when characters are useful instead of just being 
potential alternate costumes for video game cosmetics or whatever. Todd, or as his gentleman callers refer to him, Superman that Ho, is also slightly less wildly out of character in this movie. I mean, he's still wildly out of character, but there are smart changes to diminish it a little. For one, I've always thought that the way he killed Green Arrow in the comic was completely random and senseless. To keep his parents safe after the government attempts to kidnap them with the help of a supervillain, Todd keeps Ma and Pa Kent in the Fortress of Solitude. Batman and his crew accidentally discover them there while trying to find a way to take Todd down. In the resulting scuffle, Green Arrow accidentally hits Pa Kent in the arm with an arrow. It's just like a flesh wound that won't create any lasting damage. He's... he's fine. Todd then massively overreacts and spends several minutes beating Green Arrow to death until his head is crushed into red slime. This just seems really stupid to me. It was clearly an accident and John and Martha are literally standing over Todd begging him to stop murdering someone and he just keeps doing it. His whole moral center is his parents and he ignores them to act like a lunatic and it comes out of nowhere. There's really nothing that can justify him acting like this. Then Jor-El's cyber ghost AI thing in the fortress pops out and is also like, Holy shit son, calm down, this is nuts! Todd then ignores all three of his parents like nothing and they're never relevant again after this. They only show up to be like, clearly pants shittingly terrified of their grown up little Brightburn child and he just resents them for not backing him up on his choices. The movie opted to whittle this down too. By making this a universe where Martha Kent had died at some point, and it was just John by himself. Green Arrow's accidental archery aerodynamically pierces an artery in the aged American agriculturalist, and Todd panics and just kills him with laser eyes as a quick reflex. It's fast, and it's clear it was like a chaos of the moment thing he did without thinking. John Kent dies in that instant, and we don't get this weird, sad scene of all three of Todd's parents tearfully regretting the plague they unleashed on the universe. Sure, Green Arrow's death isn't a big heroic sacrifice here, but it works considering they removed the stupid green pill subplot that was only there as a diegetic excuse for fighting game mechanics and how wildly unbalanced the power scaling would be in this game's roster. If I take this pill, I can survive Superman throwing me into space and then slamming me into the concrete from orbit at 20,000 miles an hour! Normally, I hate when things get cut from adaptations, but this was a healthy example of trimming the fat to streamline the story and... Most of the stuff that was removed was really silly and made the story more ridiculous. I've always thought the green pill was a dumb and forced contrivance, so I don't mind that getting cut out. They also didn't dox Batman on Twitter because it's hard to take that seriously in any way. It's just so comical. And they simplified the story so we don't have Superman deciding Sinestro is a pretty cool guy who doesn't afraid of anything and working with him to murder the entire Green Lantern Corps while Hal Jordan is like, let's go yellow core. Then he throws away everything he believes in and, like, allows all of his friends to be murdered and trusts his arch nemesis at his word multiple times. The way they write the lanterns out of the movie is a bit clumsy, though. That brings me to the Guardians. They've called John, Guy, and myself back to Oa. We understand. I have to go now. My planet needs me. <laughs> Instead, time from these things is devoted to giving Plastic Man more screen time. He had the best single issue of the comic, and I like that they made him so central here because he's funny and serves as a great counterpoint to all of the regime's talking points. How will you punish people when they break whatever rules Superman comes up with? I mean, I was a criminal. I needed second, third, and fourth chances before turning my life around, so what's the deal there? Instead, the Green Pill army of super soldier stormtroopers is replaced with Amazo, the power replicating android from the comics. Unfortunately, it's still his crap-ass Super Scroll design and not the good Amazo from the Justice League show. You know, sometimes less is more. See, this was an interesting choice to me because it minimized the focus on hero versus hero battles. I feel like ever since Marvel's Civil War, we've seen a greater rise in stories where superheroes get on opposite ends of a moral quandary and then beat the tar out of each other for pointless fanboy power scaling, who would win fan service, and I honestly despise the trope. It's boring. I don't actually care if Batman could beat Superman. I like them better as friends doing world's finest camaraderie and going on double dates and sleeping together and shit. Todd is still obviously the focal point, but it also puts Raish as a clear-cut antagonist 
that no good guy can side with. And the movie does something the comic forgot to do, which is have Todd actually acknowledge that his superpowered force is over-policing to a ridiculous extent that makes him look like a giant dumb Nazi hypocrite. The Green Pill Army are so cartoonishly corrupt and evil that they make Gotham PD look like the good guys. And Todd doesn't even notice or care. Amazo goes on an over-the-top arresting spree with excessive force in Smallville, and Super Jerk shows up instantly and is like, hey, this is way too much. It's just nice to have him more involved with things on the ground instead of spending the majority of the story sitting on a throne barking orders at underlings like he's Shao Kahn. The climax is more centered on heroes of opposing sides putting aside their differences to beat a common foe. Another cliche, yes, but a preferable one to the alternative. Despite the poster for the movie and the expectations set by the game, there's surprisingly little hero versus hero fights in this version of the plot, and for my personal taste, that's a win. And last but not least, I think it just has a more satisfying ending than either of the Injustice games. Because of those games intending to be an ongoing franchise, they always have this open-ended, Todd will return for revenge kind of mood to them that makes it feel like nothing was truly resolved and it's just going to keep dragging on forever. Instead of pulling an entire Justice League out of the multiverse to stop Todd, they just get the real Superman. Red trunks and everything. I like that this was their first idea here because it shows that Batman knows deep down his version of Clark was never meant to turn into this monster and that maybe he just needed some perspective from the one person he'd still listen to. And while he was correct, that person wasn't Superman. In fact, I find it really interesting that Todd wins this fight instead. It wasn't just about the nicer guy getting to win by being more virtuous. Sure, they're identical and evenly matched in every way, but Superman doesn't have the same killer instinct. He's holding back because he's not a murderer like Todd, so he actually loses. Then, the one person that Todd would listen to steps through, and it's a Lois Lane that survived with the baby from another world. Many times in the book, other characters say, Lois Lane wouldn't want this, and Todd just goes, I don't care, shut up. But to have the character actually confront that notion in a way he can't rationalize or ignore was really cool. He can't just shut down the idea because she's right there staring him in the face and saying, this is wrong. And instead of doubling and tripling down, he realizes he's completely ruined himself and gives up because they made one last attempt to appeal to his humanity instead of just using brute force and having a big dumb superhero battle. Instead of him sitting in the Red Sun prison cell counting the minutes until he can start this all up again for sequel bait, he turns himself in willingly and it just feels like a more definitive and more satisfying conclusion. It doesn't leave the same Captain America dead on the table bitter feeling that I get from the game's endings. Where it's like, we won, but only for now, and at what cost? The game's endings always felt very Pyrrhic to me, but this has a different tone to it where I can accept that it's over, and the characters actually learned something. Maybe the movie isn't perfect. Its character designs are a little unappealing, and the animation could be a lot better. Hell, I think it could have had a better voice cast in some cases too. But by God, I think the script was trying, and for the most part succeeding at presenting this dumpster fire in the most cohesive and reasonable way it could. Many characters were saved from being completely out of character in ways that were too hard to reconcile with their established personalities, even if that meant cutting their involvement short. But I like the simplification. I like that this is so much easier and more pleasant to get through than the bitter grimness of the comic or the dude bro chest pounding stupidity of the game story. I feel like people didn't give this a fair chance and just got angry at changes for the adaptation, but they didn't consider why these things were changed and what benefits they actually have for the story. I think I'd vibe with these ideas better if Injustice just tried to separate itself a little bit more visually from the regular DC universe, like the Justice Lords did with their black and white team jerseys. Todd in the games needs a big scar on his eye or a robot arm and a goatee or something so people would stop looking at him and seeing Superman. Because they're very different characters. The least the movie could do is try to bring them back together a little bit while still following some of the major beats of the comic and game. I've never really liked the idea of Injustice as a whole, but out of all the ways you can experience that story, this is the one I prefer most. But this is a dark alternate timeline where I've turned on my closest allies and gone mad with power, so what do I know?
And one last thanks to Conflict of Nations. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. Choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles, and take over the world. Once again, you can get an exclusive gift. Click the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Offer only available for 30 days, don't lose time! Click the link in the description, choose your country, and fight your way to victory. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, Finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years! Not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So, maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist? If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If everyone who watched this video donated one dollar a month, I'd be able to afford a house for myself, so that would be, that would be really cool. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic, or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator quote XavierGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time!